from Case at 12. Good morning, San Antonio starts right now. Hey there, good morning. It's Friday, November 20th. Happy Friday to you. Earlier this week, we were showing you the uh, sad state of affairs in Cincinnati, Ohio. The city's Christmas tree was looking a little forlorn, but it's received love otherwise. Well, we have another example. Yeah, now uh, people are after the Rockefeller Christmas tree. In so. New York City, yeah. As Take a matter of fact, it's getting trolled on Twitter for being on brand for 2020. The official Twitter account for Rockefeller Center posted a photo of the tree on Saturday exclaiming that the gargantuan spruce had officially arrived at the plaza, but it didn't receive the warm holiday greeting that usually accompanies the annual tradition. Yeah, the 75 foot tall Norway spruce was acquired in upstate New York and there's the before and after folks. Before full, after, it looks like about the lower third was stripped away <laughs> as it was transported down to Manhattan. Uh, some of the comments on Twitter, uh, there's put, uh, there's one like, how it started, how it's going, and then what is wrong with the tree? This is what it looked like before it was cut, and now, gulp. And is, is this one, I'm sorry, but I've never laughed so hard at a picture of a tree before. This tree is perfect for this year. In one other tweet, one of my favorites, in true 2020 form, the Rockefeller Center Christmas tree looks like it tried to cut its own hair. <laughs> and that went bad. Uh, Let's see, a worker helping set up the Rockefeller Center Christmas tree found a holiday surprise also that we'll be talking about later in the newscast, which is a tiny little owl. So that's like the plus side of it. That's the plus side of it. Uh, David Sears was talking about that just yesterday, but we do have a follow up to a Rockefeller the owl. But anyway, uh, hopefully they're going to get the Rockefeller Center Christmas tree up to specs and uh, looking good in the next couple of days. For now, let's look at today's nine at nine. Nearly 200,000 new COVID-19 cases were reported across the U.S. yesterday. The CDC now predicts an additional 46,000 Americans could die from COVID-19 by December 12th. Thanksgiving week normally sees some of the busiest travel days of the year, but amid the pandemic, health experts are recommending that Americans do not travel. The CDC says people should celebrate virtually or only with people they live with. Pfizer officially asking U.S. regulators today to allow emergency use of its COVID-19 vaccine. The filing would set off a chain of events as the FDA and its independent advisors debate if the shots are ready. Bear County Sheriff's deputies investigating after human remains are found in rural southeast Bear County. Sheriff Javier Salazar says a county work crew was picking up trash in the area yesterday afternoon when they made the discovery. After completing a statewide audit, Georgia has confirmed that President-elect Joe Biden won the state by more than 12,000 votes. The state plans to certify those results today. President Trump's campaign is expected to ask for another recount. Today marks four years since San Antonio Police Detective Benjamin Marconi was shot and killed outside public safety headquarters. Otis McCain is facing the death penalty in this case. His trial was supposed to take place earlier this year, but was delayed due to the pandemic. The Department of Justice has filed a complaint against the couple on the hit reality series Tiger King. Jeffrey and Lauren Lowe are accused of failing to provide basic vet care, safe living conditions, and appropriate food for the animals featured on the show. NBA free agency window opens today at 5 p.m. More than 100 players and unrestricted free agents. Another 75 or so can be restricted free agents. Players can start signing with new teams Sunday afternoon. Senator John Cornyn announced that San Antonio has been selected as one of six finalist cities to host the U.S. Space Command headquarters. The Air Force anticipates it will choose a location in early 2021. And that's today's 9 at 9. And we have more local news coming up in this half hour. But well, let's check on the pretty weather with Justin Horn. And you guys might be surprised to hear that uh, it's foggy outside. Yeah, we did. <laughs> uh, this pattern has been pretty consistent, hasn't it? We've got some fog here in San Antonio, although visibility is starting to improve as we would expect this time of morning. 62 degrees right now. Calm winds. Dew point is at 61. A lot of humidity out there, which is contributing to that fog right now. Temperatures today will be up near 80. It's right where we were yesterday. We should see mostly sunny skies this afternoon. Let's check in on those visibilities around the area. In places like Cashville and Hondo, you're down about a quarter of a mile. At the airport, it's down close to zero. 
So that is still a problem spot there, but you'll notice Port SA is up to 10 miles. So this is the uh, definition of patchy fog. New Braunfels also seeing uh, some visibility issues at this hour. We'll zoom out some. Uh, it stretches down the Pleasanton and out towards Gonzales as well. Uh, here are the weather headlines. So we're off to another foggy start. We're going to get a couple fronts, one Sunday night, another on Tuesday night, both of which don't bring great chances of rain with them. Uh, but we will get some drier air in here next week, and that means pretty good looking Thanksgiving. We're going to take a look at that forecast, let you know what temperatures look like coming up here in just a few minutes. Guys. Thank you, Justin. And fog is hanging around in some of these transcut shots, including I-35 at Powell. Don't see any accidents on any of these transcribed screens. New this morning at 9, police are trying to figure out why a woman stabbed a man at a bus stop just outside of Haven for Hope. Police are telling us it happened uh, around 640 this morning near Frio and Haven for Hope Way. Officers say the man was taken to a hospital and is expected to be okay. Investigators say Haven for Hope security guards caught the woman after witnesses pointed her out. They detained her until officers arrived. Right now, it's not clear what charges she'll be facing. Other top stories are following today. We're still waiting to learn the name of a man found dead overnight on the city's northwest side. Police tell us a driver who hit him did not stop to call for help. Officers tell us a passerby saw the man lying in the street around 11 last night. This was in the 1200 block of Bandera, not far from West Woodlawn Avenue and Hill Crest Drive. Investigators determined the victim had been hit by a vehicle and was pronounced dead at the scene. Police found debris from a vehicle at the scene, but so far the driver has not yet been located. A driver who police say was speeding and possibly drunk is expected to face charges after a deadly crash overnight. This would happen on 281 near Thousand Oaks around 1:30 this morning. Police say the suspect was driving his pickup uh, when he slammed into a car, crushing it. A woman inside died at the scene. Right now we're waiting to learn her name. Investigators tell us the suspect appeared to be intoxicated, so they're running the test to confirm that. If that is the case, he will face a charge of intoxication manslaughter. 6,500, that's how many Walmart gift cards and goodie bags are being distributed to military personnel today. It's all part of the 10th annual Turkey for Troops event at Toyota of Bernie. Now this is a live look at the giveaway, which started just a few minutes ago, and it will go through 5 p.m. today. Toyota of Bernie is expecting a large turnout, and they are encouraging people to arrive early. For more information, you can visit turkeysfortroops.com. The goodie bag is not the only thing up for grabs. At 1 p.m., the Military Warriors Support Foundation presenting two service members with renovated mortgage-free homes. How about that? But again, a live look at that uh, giveaway underway as we speak at Toyota of Bernie up off of I-10. The countdown to Christmas is on. We are just about 35 days away from the holiday, and San Antonio is getting in the holiday spirit. Overnight, the city continued to put up light to decorate the tree in Travis Park. Preparation ahead of the virtual tree lighting ceremony that will take place coming up on November 27th. The tree is being decorated with more than 10,000 red, white, and blue lights and dozens of handmade decorations. The lights will be turned on at 7.20 p.m. on Black Friday, followed by musical entertainment by a mariachi band. In your morning headlines, a woman pushed into the path of an oncoming subway train. We also have flying concrete, flying trampolines, and a singing teacher. Our David Sears is here this morning. This singing teacher has a catchy tune. Oh, I've been singing it all morning. Yeah. We'll sing along in just a second, but first, keep your eyes on this part of the screen over here. See, that's a woman right there. Watch what happens. Yep, some guy just shoved her onto the tracks of the New York subway. I'll show it to you again. You can see the post right there. There she is. She kind of is like leaning up against that post. Then all of a sudden she just gets shoved onto the tracks. The good news is she survived. The video stopped just before the train actually got to her. This all happened during rush hour about 8.30 yesterday morning. The victim was on her way to work and just minding her own business when she was shoved. She ended up between the tracks. Workers held down the suspect until police arrived. He is a 23-year-old homeless man who authorities believe has mental issues. The victim taken to Bellevue Hospital with minor injuries. It's very disturbing. We've seen him waiting, calcul calculating for the, the uh, train to approach the station. I'm sure it was an absolutely terrifying, horrifying experience for her. Um, and look, no one deserves that. And we have to, we got to do better. Yeah, this was the second time in a week that someone was shoved into the path of an oncoming subway train. That suspect also believed to have mental issues. And look out, dude, car, and whoa! 
How about a concrete slab? How lucky is that guy? That is a two ton slab of concrete that just came off the side of a building and fell nine stories. It's actually happening in Russia. This happened in the city of Vladivostok. That is near the Sea of Japan, north of North Korea for you Russian folks who know where you're your, your geography in Russia is. Okay. It was ice rain that apparently caused it all. It happened the night before. Now, the guy's wife had just gone inside, so she's lucky. There was also another slab of concrete that fell off another building on the same street. Now, you got to wonder who was building those buildings. Dude, oh my God. It's going to land on the freeway. Yep. That was a trampoline flying through the air. We'll see it again. Where is it? It's right. They got to find it there. Yeah, it's one of those backyard trampolines. This is in Northern California. The area experienced some weird weather, storms, strong winds, things getting blown all over the place, yard tools scattered around, trees uprooted. One guy ended up with three big old trash cans in his front yard, says he's got no idea who one of them belongs to. And what do they say? What goes up must come down. There's that trampoline behind that pickup truck being drug right back to where it was. Even has the basketball goal still attached. Just lucky what a kid inside when it took off. Six feet apart. Six feet apart. There you go. Six feet. Six Gotta love this teacher. Got those kids entertained. Gotta keep their attention somehow these days. That is social studies teacher Yvonne Drew singing the Six Feet Apart song. She is a teacher at the Envision Science Academy in Wake Forest, North Carolina. She had it all down, the gloves, the mask, the wipes, the song. Yvonne said if you've got, got to find some sunshine in this unprecedented time and showing the kids some love and having some fun, whatever we can do to make this day better than yesterday. <laughs> And you know the kids are laughing, and they got the masks on, so yeah. you can't see. But they're, they're laughing when they're walking down the hall, having a good old time. And on their way to the bus, on the way home, they're going six, six feet, feet apart. apart. <laughs> six feet apart. Yeah, hit record before it's all over. Mm -hmm. yeah. she'll, have a, she'll be dropping that on iTunes one day. Uh, yeah, she, probably. she should. Justin, did you like how I did that? I appreciate that. There you go. <laughs> a little, little drop on iTunes. Yeah. Awesome. Very soon. Thank you, David. <laughs> Right now it is 9, 10, 62 degrees. Still, he's still singing it. Uh, GM, still ahead on GMSA at nine. A Southside doctor using his love of art to help those who cannot afford health care. How you can purchase one of his paintings. Tracking the rise of sea levels all across the world. That's the goal of a NASA satellite launching this weekend. A NASA engineer joining us live to talk more about this important mission later in this newscast. Gobble, gobble, it's that time of the year. Some students at NEISD made some special turkey crafts for very, very loved members or of our community. Just ahead here on GMSA at 9, how they're working with the folks at the Raul Jimenez Thanksgiving dinner to make sure they're delivered. And taking a look at stocks this morning, the Dow down 96 points. We'll be right back. And welcome back. It is 914. Over the last few weeks, elementary school students from NEISD have been hard at work creating cards for Thanksgiving. Thousands of cards were thoughtfully designed as a community outreach event for the Raul Jimenez Thanksgiving dinner. Alicia Beretta visited the district central office ahead of their delivery. Googly eyes, paper feathers, scarecrows, and some solid words of advice. Do not say bad or ugly words or be nice. The stacks of boxes hold some heartfelt creations made by the youngest and brightest minds at NEISD, like third grader Anthony Buendia from Castle Hill Elementary, who shared why this activity was one of his favorites. That we could decorate them and put a turkey inside it. These works of art will be given to the 10,000 people set to receive a warm meal by the Raul Jimenez Thanksgiving dinner this year. We had one of our elementary art teachers design a lesson for us that would have a card on it, but then the children did their own if they wanted to. Like I said, I haven't counted them, but we have 46 elementary schools. I understand that the children liked it so much that they're actually making some for their family and neighbors. The cards have taken the place of the traditional place mats and centerpieces seen at the dinner in years past, and they hope the handmade art, gobbles, and words of gratitude. This one says, I hope you have a nice day, and I hope you have a good Thanksgiving, and they drew little fruits and vegetables in it. Warm the hearts of senior citizens and those struggling with homelessness. 
So it is more than a meal, it's more than sustenance. We want to give this gratitude and this thanks and this just spirit of love on Thanksgiving Day. So looking through those cards really meant a lot because those kids come from that innocence and, and the place of a child's heart. Happy Thanksgiving! As for Anthony, he's thankful for the same blessing that the Raul Jimenez dinner will give to thousands this year. He's eating turkey, we're eating turkey, everyone's so excited. And the Raul Jimenez Thanksgiving dinner will begin their catering to organizations throughout San Antonio on Wednesday. So there may be some stacks of those beautiful cards in there. And of course, on Thursday, when they begin those individual meal distributions. And another thing to note, Mark and Stephanie, although they have reached capacity, the Raul Jimenez Thanksgiving dinner is still accepting donations to cover the cost of these meals. And we, of course, have that link on ksat.com. Mark, Steph? That's very good. I love those cards. So creative. Yep. Alicia Beretta, live near downtown. Thank you, Alicia. Have a good weekend. Thank you. Justin's here with a look at the weekend forecast, and uh, he likes to start things out by going back. Yeah, yeah we go, we go back in time. I love to watch the fog roll in. I think it just looks cool. So let's take a look at it on time lapse, and you can watch it over time. We had some clear skies, and then boom, right there. There's the fog. Uh, it's, it's been around for a couple of hours now, and at the airport, visibility is still fairly low. 62 degrees, the current uh, reading. Dew point is at 61, and you can see the temperature dew point close together. And there you go. You get calm winds. That will create some fog. And right now, visibility is down to about six-tenths of a mile there around Randolph. Down to the south around Stinson at two miles. Notice the western half of Bear County doing okay fog-wise. So it is patchy around town, but still close to zero there around the airport. And uh, we can take a look at some of the Transkite cameras there. It looks pretty good. Uh, even I-37 and South Cross, not a lot of issues there. 410, FM 78, it looks fairly clear. I think it's mostly there around the airport where the visibility is uh, sort of at its lowest. And uh, we'll go on and look at the uh, wider view here and uh, places like New Braunfels still seeing some fog. Hondo, some improvement there, and then Pleasanton down to about a quarter of a mile for those folks. But uh, outside of that, we've got the most clear skies. Uh, temperatures 65, New Braunfels 64, and Gonzales 68, Beeville 68, Catula. They're warm this morning. We have that moisture in place, so that's going to keep temperatures up. And as we look at the satellite picture, uh, you can pick out the fog sort of scattered about here. We're also seeing some uh, low cloudiness over around Del Rio and Rock Springs, and then down to the south. We've got perfectly clear skies, so temperatures will warm up there a little bit quicker this morning at least. And you can see the clouds and fog lining up across really I-35 there. So get up towards Dallas, there's quite a bit of cloud cover and fog even into the Metroplex. And uh, a frontal boundary that is in place across the Texas Panhandle. It's not bitterly cold behind this front, but this is the same front that should work through Sunday night here for us. And it's not really going to cool us down all that much. And unfortunately, it does not look like it's going to bring us Really great chances for rain. Uh, we've been hoping for better chances, but it's just not playing out like that. So as we go into Saturday, 7 o'clock, we'll get some clouds tomorrow morning, maybe some drizzle. And then as we get into Sunday afternoon, we'll fast forward there. This shows a couple of showers right along the front, if we're lucky. We'll put in a 10% chance at this point. And then on Tuesday, that's going to be a warm day. We're going to get warm air surging north, so some 80s on Tuesday. Here's our second front, which comes in Tuesday night into Wednesday morning. That brings with it an outside chance of a shower storm. But right now we have that at 10% too. Just not great rain chances. And drier air moves in behind that, which means we're going to see a pretty good Thanksgiving. Speaking of the Thanksgiving forecast, we can now look forward and uh, talk about what we can expect. Uh, this graphic was it's kind of funny. Uh, a socially distant uh, Thanksgiving. Aww. You know, you may have to zoom in some of your family members, uh, depending on where they are. Uh, 74 degrees is what we're expecting on Thanksgiving Day with mostly sunny skies, however you're planning to celebrate. Rest of today, we're going to be up near 80. Southeasterly winds 5 to 10 miles per hour, and we should clear out nicely this afternoon. A bit more cloud cover over the weekend, and we could see some morning drizzle both Saturday and Sunday. There's that 10% chance of rain both days, but you don't have to worry too much about it. Uh, Monday, partly cloudy. Warm day on Tuesday and breezy, and then a little cooler behind that next front. 70s, but dry Wednesday and for Thanksgiving Day. Guys. Your turkey's got that, that left, left lean down. Yeah, mm -hmm. he's uh, playing a little bit of peekaboo there. I think. Or dancing. But your turkey earlier was cute. <laughs> one of them, I guess the virtual turkeys, yes. one of them was like shivering. 
Yeah. Cold. Uh -huh. Yeah, That's he's cute. probably up north somewhere. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> or somebody you. just put him in the fridge. <laughs> oh. <laughs> 920, 62 degrees. And still ahead on GMSA at 9, if you go inside the San Antonio Family Medicine Clinic, you're going to notice it looks less like a clinic and a little more like an art gallery. Erica Nandes will explain why next. And welcome back. It's 924, a Southside doctor using his love for art to help those who can't afford health care. Eric Hernandez shares his story. To some, it may look like an art gallery, but this is Casa Salud Family Medicine Clinic and these paintings created by Dr. Ray Altamirano. The hobby I have um, and I sell some of my prints um, and the proceeds that I make from this, we try to fund people who can't pay for their visit. That is the goal of Casa Salud, to make sure those who can't afford medical care still have somewhere to go. You know, we're definitely a home for the uninsured and the undocumented where all, all doors are open for everybody. A recent Kaiser Family Foundation report revealed that the number of uninsured in the United States continues to increase and the Hispanic community is the most affected. It is one of the reasons why Casa Salud is on the south side. It's a cultural thing. The BC rates, diabetes rates, high blood pressure rates. Some of it is education, some of it is just lack of access, just trying to, to cater to this demographic that needs it the most. No questions asked, a visit to Casa Salud with some basic lab work will only cost a patient $100. If anything extra is needed or if a specialist is required, Dr. Altamirano points patients toward other affordable options. So many people are leaving health insurance not, and not by choice, right? They lost their job or whatnot and they're on chronic, they have chronic conditions and need chronic help. So, you know, there's a place for them and there's a home, right? And, and Well, currently Casa Salud can visit with patients in person or over the phone. For more information, just head to our website, kset.com. Mark, Steph. And Erica, if someone is interested in purchasing a painting to help out, how would they go about getting one? Yeah, so you just go to the Casa Salud website. It's casasalud210.com. And on there, you can see the entire gallery of all the paintings and select the one you want. And then you're able to purchase it and give back to someone in need. All right, Erica Hernandez, live from home. Have a good weekend, Erica. Bye, Erica. Thank you guys, thank you. Thanks, 926, 62 degrees. More ahead on GMSA at 9. NASA is launching a new satellite into space that will monitor global sea levels. We're going to speak live with one of the engineers who worked on the project. And the weekend is here. That means football, football, and guess what? Even more football. football. RJ Marquez has a breakdown of games you can enjoy this weekend. And Texas hospitals struggling due to a rise in COVID-19 cases across the state. We are going to go inside a hospital in Odessa to see how nurses and doctors are coping. And welcome back. It's about 930. Texas has set a new state record for single day COVID-19 cases. More than 12,000 cases were reported on Thursday. With that surge in cases, hospitals across the state are reaching capacity. CNN's Omar Jimenez takes us inside a hospital over in Odessa. It's a reality this part of Texas has only seen in its nightmares. The ICU at Odessa Regional Medical Center in Odessa, Texas, is at its capacity with COVID-19 patients. Do you have an IS? Even with this hospital at maximum capacity, they're still trying to find places to put COVID-19 patients. All of the beds that you see in this section, curtained off at the moment, did not exist before the pandemic. <coughs> now, it's filled to its absolute capacity, while patients here literally are fighting for their lives. We lost about 10 patients last week, and one of them had been on a ventilator for about a month. The ones that are here now, on average, they've been on a vent for about a week or so. Denise Morning We're getting closer, okay? is an acute care nurse practitioner. There was only a few times in the summer where we were really pushed to the extreme, but now for the last uh, few weeks, we're busting out of the seams. But she and everyone else remain at war with the virus, even as some patients begin to take a turn for the worse. When you first have to make that declaration, what is the first thing that goes through your mind? Please, not another one. You know, it's a, it's a prayer. It's inevitable and we know what's going to happen, but the probability of it being a good outcome is very, very low. But most are able to fight it off. Look at you! And turn the corner. Ruben Romero is feeling better after two weeks in the hospital and says this isn't a game. I asked why. Me dijiste que este no es un juego. ¿Por qué? 
Because this is really serious, he says. This virus is not for people to be playing with. It's very dangerous. It attacks your entire body. I'm living it, he says. And it's become life for so many in this part of the state. Hospital officials in Odessa say anywhere from 35 to 40 percent of the people getting tested are testing positive for COVID-19. People aren't taking the precautions that they need. Yes, we're frontline here in the hospital, but the real front line is on the streets, in the grocery stores. Wash your hands, wear your mask, stay away. I promise that the little bit of time and the little bit of effort it takes outside of here is worth it. Because once you're here, wearing a mask is better than having a tube down your throat. I promise. That was CNN's Omar Jimenez reporting from Odessa. Health officials there say they are worried about becoming what El Paso has become with hundreds of patients in the ICU and with mobile morgues for the dead. And right now, let's go outside with live cam, waiting for that fog to burn off just about everywhere. Give us a progress report, Justin. Well, it's looking a little bit better. It's usually about this time of morning that we see that fog lift and indeed on live cam. That's what we're seeing there off in the distance. Let's check in on the visibilities though very quickly and at the airport, it's still showing close to zero. So that's still one of the problem spots. Randolph showing some improvement. Stinson showing some improvement. Uh, New Braunfels, same story, Castroville out towards Hondo. So generally speaking, this fog is beginning to lift. We'll zoom out some. Pleasanton still seeing some visibility down close to about a quarter of a mile. Here is our expected high temperature today. We're thinking 80 degrees. It, it was like that yesterday. We had mostly sunny skies got up to 80, so a very similar day today. Uh, very comfortable, maybe a little bit more humid. We've got some football games tonight. If you're heading out to any of the Friday night football games, looks pretty good. We'll call for mostly clear conditions. Temperatures 71 to kickoff down to 68 at halftime. Pretty ideal. Sunset will be around 536 p.m. The rise in sea levels around the world is one of the most discussed factors of uh, change in our climate. Now NASA, in collaboration with European partners and NOAA, is launching the first of two satellites that will keep tracking uh, sea level measurements through 2030. To talk about this important mission, we've got a special guest this morning. NASA engineer Shannon Statham is joining us live from Lompoc, California. Good morning, Shannon. Good morning. Uh, so let's start with the basics here. We've got a couple questions for you. Tell us more about this new mission that is launching tomorrow. Yes, Sentinel-6 Michael Freilich is all about water. And our mission is to precisely measure the heights of our oceans and continue a sea level rise record that NASA started nearly 30 years ago in the early 90s. So why is measuring sea level important and what does it tell us about how the climate is changing? Sea level it rise is important because it is the most visible impact of climate change. And we can clearly see from the data collected over the last 30 years that the sea level is rising and it's rising by about three millimeters per year or over a centimeter per decade. And the reason it's rising is because 90% of the heat from trapped greenhouse gases in our atmosphere gets absorbed by the ocean. And that increase in heat causes expansion. And that's where we see increased sea level heights as well as eroding coastal lines. We also have the melting glaciers due to our warming planet that again adds to that sea level rise. And we just, it's so important that we continue to monitor this because not only do we know that it's rising, we know that that rise is increasing in rate. When these missions started in the 90s, we were seeing closer to two millimeters per year. And now in the last couple of years, we're seeing closer to four millimeters per year. So just in the span of 30 years, we're seeing a double in rate of sea level rise. And so that's very important. It's so important to people that live at the coast and seeing those eroding coastal lines near their homes and businesses. So we definitely want to continue monitoring that at NASA. And that is important. And so I think the next question a lot of people will have is, how do we use satellites to actually do this? Yes, so Sentinel-6 Michael Freilich has a suite of science instruments that enable these very precise measurements. And the primary instrument is a radar, similar to the radar that police officers use to check the speed of a vehicle. We use a radar to send a pulse to the surface of the ocean, and then that pulse bounces back or reflects to the satellite. And depending on the time at which it took for that signal to return to the satellite, we can very easily detect the height of the ocean. And then here's something that's important to me. How, how do these satellites help improve weather forecasts, such as the models and uh, the track information and evolution of hurricanes? 
Yes. Well, sea level rise is so important to that because as we see, the rise is due to a warming ocean. And usually where you see warmer oceans, you're going to see big weather phenomena like hurricanes. We also have a new instrument on board that uses radio occultation to measure temperature and humidity in the atmosphere. And those are critical elements to weather forecasting and improving climate models. Awesome. So a uh, final question here. Where can people learn more and stay up to date on this mission? Yes, well, the best place to learn more about Sentinel-6 Michael Freilich is sealevel.jpl.nasa.gov, and that's where you can also learn a lot about the legacy of these missions and where you can find the publicly available data. Great stuff. We appreciate you joining us this morning. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. All right. Mark, Steph? Thank you very much. Very informative stuff. And the name of the satellite, she kind of breezed through it there a couple times. It was a little hard to hear, but it's called the Sentinel-6 Michael Freilich. Why is it Michael Freilich? That is the name of the former director of NASA's Earth Science Division. Oh, that's cool. Nice yeah. little tribute there. Yeah, so Sentinel-6, Michael Freilich. Right now, <laughs> 938, 62 degrees. And you're watching GMSA at 9 after a bye week last week. The Cowboys are back on the field this weekend. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> Plus, a couple of college football games postponed due to COVID-19. RJ has our weekend sports preview next. 941, first place up for grabs as two of the best high school football teams in the city play one another tonight. And the Cowboys and UTSA are back on the field. RJ Marquez joins us live from his home to preview what to watch this weekend. Hey, hey RJ. Morning. Yeah, good Friday morning, guys. Got a lot of uh, interesting action on the field this weekend. And again, just getting these games, getting these teams to play, I think has been uh, pretty impressive that we've been able to do this during this uh, current day and age with the pandemic. So let's go ahead and start with high school action and the big game this week in case that's big game coverage and what a matchup we have judson taking on steel in a battle of the two best teams in the area or two of the best teams in the area both teams are undefeated in district the rockets are 4-0 and the knights are 5-0 in district play so get this judson has actually not played since october 30th their last game was postponed due to covid 19 issues and they had to shut down their program for a little while but they are back and this should be another classic game between these two it's always one of the most anticipated games of the season uh, kickoff from Lenhoff Stadium is at 7 30 and make sure to check out case at 12 sports tonight for all the highlights on this one all right moving on to another uh, thing that happened this week with high school football tough news this week for players and coaches over at Edison as they learned their varsity football season is now over due to COVID-19 and contact tracing the district said the Golden Bears next two games including tonight's game against Memorial Memorial are officially canceled. So Edison played only three games this season. They went one and two. And remember, SAISD actually started the season late because they were uh, being uh, precautious with everything with the COVID-19 pandemic within their district. Um, tough news there for Edison. And I hope that uh, everyone there is safe and uh, they get ready for next season and uh, get going with the Golden Bears. So hopefully everyone's doing okay, the Edison community. All right, guys, moving on to some local college action this weekend. And how about UTSA? The Roadrunners are one win away from becoming bowl eligible. That's right. In Jeff Trailer's first season as the head coach. As of now, UTSA's game at Southern Mississippi is good to go. Of course, that could always change within the next 24 hours or so. We all know that. The Roadrunners had their best offensive performance of the season last week in their blowout win over UTEP. Quarterback Frank Harris had his best game of his collegiate career. Uh, the former Clemens star scored five total touchdowns. I covered Frank in high school. Love this guy. He's always been such a great guy, and he's had to battle back from a lot of injuries. So great to see Frank having success this season. Uh, UTSA is 5-4, and four, and their kickoff tomorrow is scheduled for 2 p.m. So let's see if the Roadrunners could get to six wins and get that bowl eligibility. All right, guys, moving on to the NFL. Word, like it or not, the Cowboys are back in action. Yes, all right, the Cowboys. They say that quarterback Andy Dalton is ready to return to the starting lineup three weeks after he took a brutal hit to the head. We all remember that hit. It was pretty bad. It was when the Cowboys were playing at Washington. So earlier this week, Dalton admitted that he actually didn't remember the hit. He didn't remember sort of the aftermath of what happened. And then, get this, he also tested a positive for coronavirus. So it has been really just a tough few weeks for Dalton. Good to see him get back on the field this week. He feels like he's ready to go. Hopefully the rest of the team does as well. 
the Cowboys still sitting at two wins there. They're still not completely out of the NFC East race, but uh, they uh, take on the Vikings, a uh, pretty hot Vikings team uh, with that game taking place in Minneapolis on Sunday at 325. All right, guys, uh, want to talk about the Texans. and Not really don't want to talk about the Texans, but, but I got to mention them. Um, interesting stat with the Texans. They are 2-0 and this season against the Jacksonville Jaguars and 0-7 against everyone else. They've lost every other game. So unless the NFL schedules the rest of their games against Jacksonville. I think the Texans might be done for the year. They play the Patriots Sunday at noon. Um, and we didn't mention Texas and Texas A&M because those games have been postponed. Uh, this is actually the second weekend that the Aggies had their game postponed. The Longhorns, the first time that the uh, pandemic has affected their schedule. And wanted to circle back around to Roosevelt, Reagan, a couple of big other high school games that we're watching uh, for tonight. Roosevelt, Reagan, a big Northeast ISD matchup. Lanier versus Brack, always love that. That's an old school rivalry game. And these smaller schools are already in the playoffs. So Hondo versus Wimberley, love that matchup. The Owls versus the Texans, great mascot, mascot matchup as well. Uh, one of the games of the night. And, uh, you know, Mark and Stephanie and Justin as well. You know, I do have a little bit of a solution to this uh, Texas Texas thing, and I think you guys, let's just have them play each other finally <laughs> after years. They've been avoiding each other. Let's have the Longhorns and Aggies are oh, again yeah. this year. I'm in on I, that. Oh, that's what it was. Okay, you were <laughs> yeah. a little, you were garbled there for a second. Yeah. I didn't know, I didn't know who you wanted to match up. So yeah, you know. the Longhorns and the Aggies. Uh, people have been trying to get that going for years, right? Yeah. This it, is it's the, been at least like 10 years, I think, right? It, it, Justin, it, I can't even remember the it's last been, time It's played. been a while. It's been a long time. Yeah, at least 10 years, and it's yeah. it's time. I yeah. agree. Yeah. Well, fun it used to be a Thanksgiving tradition. Yeah. Yeah, it so used to be. Could... Fun fact, RJ, my brother went to A&M, and I, you know, I went to UT. My mom actually went to a game, and she was cheering for both teams. <laughs> and people, as, were, as people were like, what's wrong with this athlete. lady? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Pretty cool stuff. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, that is what's taking place this weekend, guys. Uh, make sure to check it all out on KSAT.com and KSAT Sports. All right. RJ Marquez live from home. Thank you, RJ. Thank you, RJ. And I don't know if I want to face you right now in football. A&M's right looking about pretty that. good. You're right. They, they do look good. <laughs> we'll just put it off for another year. Yeah. Well, and Ursula's already making her bet about the LSU A&M game. Oh, wow. And, you know, LSU is, eh, they did win last year. <laughs> I'm, I'm feeling good this year. I'm feeling really good about you it. You should. You should. You. Uh, let's take a look at this picture on our KSA Connect. Beautiful shot here of the colors out at Lost Maples. We've shown a few of these pictures, but this is just another great one. I, I really think things are peaking right now as far as tree colors go. Even here in San Antonio, we're starting to see some of those changes. So beautiful shot, Liz. Thank you very much for sending that in. Let's check in on the fog. Look at that. We just saw improvement at the airport. We went from close to zero now up to four miles. I think the fog's pretty much cleared out at this point. There may be a little bit left over here and there, but we're going to see mostly sunny skies from here on out. And that will boost those temperatures uh, on a lot of spots. Uh, Pleasanton still down to about a mile visible. At least it's one place where the fog may be hanging on. There's the scene outside. You can see the clouds breaking up. 63 degrees at the airport. Southeasterly winds at about three miles per hour. In the visible satellite picture, yeah, you can see where that fog was, and you can also see it starting to break up there. Temperature-wise, uh, 60s for the most part here in Bear County, 61 Stinson, 63 for our friends in Seguin this morning, 65 in New Braunfels, 62 Pleasanton, 65 Kennedy, and then 70. That's our warm spot down in Carrizo Springs where it is sunny at this hour. Dew point tracker shows that uh, we'll see dew points stay relatively high over the weekend, so that's going to lead to some morning clouds and morning drizzle. Weak frontal boundary Sunday, so that brings dew points down a little bit, a little bit on Monday. It's a little drier. Tuesday, we build them back up, and then by Wednesday, they'll fall off again as another front comes through. So we do have a couple fronts to talk about, just not a lot of rain, and that's the unfortunate part. Our first front is sitting up across the Texas Panhandle this morning. A little cooler behind it, but this isn't bitterly cold air. This isn't a terribly strong front. It's going to take it some time before it gets all the way down here, and we think that'll happen Sunday night. So let's fast forward through the forecast here. This is tomorrow morning. Shows quite a bit of cloud cover, and again, maybe a driz some drizzle. And we can't count out a, a shower or two tomorrow. It'll be a stray shower, and the, it, it's not going to amount to much rainfall at all. And with the front, this is 5 o'clock Sunday, we notice a couple of showers trying to develop there. It's possible we're going to put it at a 10% chance, which I know is lower than what we had earlier, but we just keep kind of dropping rain chances here because it's not, it's just not looking great. Tuesday, we'll get some warmer air moving in here briefly before our next front comes through. 
and late Tuesday, early Wednesday, there could be a thin line of showers, maybe a thunderstorm along this front, but just like the last front, rain chances are at 10%. Very low. Dry air builds in behind that. And back by popular demand, here's the uh, 2020 Thanksgiving forecast. Socially distant Thanksgiving forecast. Uh, maybe you're zooming in all your uh, cousins or relatives, what have you. Uh, 74 degrees, mostly sunny on Thanksgiving Day. Looks pretty good. Uh, that dinner looks good, too. Uh, temperatures up around 80 degrees. Southeasterly winds 5 to 10 miles per hour today. And 79 Saturday, 77 Sunday with the drizzle both days. Monday, partly cloudy, warm on Tuesday and breezy, and then clearing out Wednesday, Thursday, highs in the low to mid-70s, drier air. And, you know, I just noticed in that graphic, the, uh, the relatives were turkeys, right? Yeah. They seem to be eating a turkey. That's a little awkward. Ooh, well, maybe yeah. it's, a, it's like a veggie turkey or something. Yeah, let's, like let's go with that. <laughs> Tofurkey? <laughs> sure. <laughs> wow, your turkeys have issues. <laughs> Thank you, Justin. 951, yep. 63 degrees. We'll be right back. <laughs> Hey there, good morning. Coming up on live, Chris Sullivan from This Is Us Plus Crafts and Activities that put the thanks in Thanksgiving. We'll see you soon here on live. So the reason I'm participating in No Shave November once again this year is to not only raise awareness for men's health and men's cancer, but for all cancers. Uh, my wife and mother are both cancer survivors. So if you would please, Go to our website and click on the link and donate today. GMSA's Officer Marcus Trujillo, just one of our teammates this month. So far, Team KSAT, as of this morning, has raised almost $4,000 for No Shave November. In the top five, I've raised $1,200, Justin, $410, Dylan, $400, uh, David Sears, $335, and Max Massey, $303. But keep those donations yes. coming. We have about 10 more days to go. And congratulations to you, Mark. You reached your goal. That Today. Was, that is what you set out to do. And yes. of course, thank you guys for donating. Could have done Appreciate it without it. you folks. Yes, thank thank you. you. We have a follow-up to a story we ran yesterday about the Rockefeller Center Christmas tree. Yeah, remember there was an owl in the tree. They cut down the tree. They hauled it to New York about 75 miles, and the guy that was putting up the tree had this owl staring him in the face. Went, Ooh. So the owl was a little dehydrated, a little, little thin, so they took care of the owl, and now the owl is real famous. Yeah, now he's a bobblehead. Take a look. I mean, that, that was quick. <laughs> this is courtesy so of the Bobblehead <laughs> Hall of Fame and Museum. And he is uh, $25 right now. Uh, you can buy him online. This is a website that Mark found. It's uh, bobbleheadhall.com. Yes, mm -hmm. pre-orders. They're taking pre-orders now, but that was quick. Can you really turn yeah. a bobblehead that quick I, if you need to? Apparently, if you're an owl, it happens fast. Yeah, huh. we were just Who talking knew? about this. Ah. Oh, <laughs> Who knew? It's Thank too you. early for dad jokes. Thank you very much. That's a Friday joke for you right there. Bobbleheadhall.com. <laughs> Get those orders in now. $25 plus shipping. So cute. Fun. It's a great way to remember the tree. That's right. Yeah. Have a great weekend, everybody. <laughs> Bye, guys.